Thank you for joining. Thank you for making time in your day, whether this is late in the day for you on the East Coast in the US or early in the day in Asia. <laughs> uh, thank you for making time for us as always. Um, and for those of you who are subscribers, we appreciate you. We love hearing from you. So please, um, please email us, uh, send us DMs about how you're liking or not liking Sportsbox so we can uh, continue to make our product better. Um, today, we're going to have Dr. Bill Cheatham and Ryan Crawley share um, some really, really valuable information and practical knowledge, coaching knowledge on using the kinematic sequence data that is now available on Sportsbox. Uh, if you haven't used it um, or seen it, but unsure how to use it, this is the perfect place to learn how, or at least I should say a starting point um, for learning how to use it, because there's so much that you can do with this information that's going to enrich um, your coaching experience and um, the experience for your students. And uh, I personally enjoy just nerding out on the data and looking at all the different slings and um, what the data says. Uh, before we get to the ed actual education part, I wanted to share um, a couple, couple quick updates um, that uh, would be, um, that you guys might be interested in. So let me share screen. Um, so nothing crazy, but I, I do have some app updates that you may have missed. Um, we, we make an update every, significant update every four to six weeks. Um, so if, um, you know, if you aren't getting emails about these feature updates that um, uh, we, we send out previews of these updates that are coming and reminders to download the updates. So if you're not, if you're not getting those emails, please get with us because there's a lot of good stuff that we're sharing along the way to make sure that you're well informed on, uh, on these things. Um, we do have very, very, very big updates on the app, uh, coming in the next two to four weeks. I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it a secret until you get these emails from us, but they are significant updates to the app, uh, user experience. Um, so look out for those, but I will today quickly share my screen on the app to point out a couple of things that, that you may have missed. And then um, obviously, you know, you're here for the education, uh, but uh, you know, 45 minutes uh, session will probably just be um, kind of a starting point for all the great stuff that you can learn. And uh, we have this great program bootcamp uh, available to you. Uh, a lot of you have gone through the bootcamp experience with Ryan. It's a five week, so five 30 minute sessions that happen weekly that aren't really just a one way sharing of information, more of a workshop format um, and a lot of tutorials that are active and, you know, interactive. Um, and uh, Ryan's been doing a great job with the, with these sessions. So if you have not signed up for, um, for the bootcamp, please do so. We're offering a 50% off of our, um, our standard rates for everybody who's attending this webinar. You can use the code half off BC um, below, as you see, for 50% off. Um, and you get six PDR credits for those of you who are in the US and are PGM members. So um, yeah, if you guys are curious about it, um, feel free to send us an email to learn more. Um, now I'm going to share my app screen just to show you a couple of cool tips and tricks. Um, by the way, if you guys, um, for those of you who are attending the webinar and have any questions, I think there's a chat function uh, or the Q and A function, and um, Paul Paul Park um, on our team, uh, leading partnerships, um, and Stephanie Way. You guys already know her. No need to intro. They were on the call, and um, between the three of us, we can um, we can uh, address those questions along the way. So please send them in as uh, you guys are going through the webinar. Um, okay. So just a couple of things uh, that you may have missed in the app. One, um, obviously we've got the speed data. Um, and when we say speed data, it's a few different types of data. One is linear speed, uh, including the mid-hand speed all the way in the left-hand corner. 
and we very conveniently show you the max hand speed in the downswing as an indicator so you don't have to go searching for it uh, by scrolling through the, the swing like this to see where the hand maxes out. Um, it is good to do this so that you can see when in the swing it maxes out. Um, I do this so that like I see where the max hand speed indicator and the hand speed tracker match up and stop the frame and see what the wrist angle is like, you know, what the arm angle is like. Uh, it's a it's a really neat uh, way to do that. And then there are angular speeds um, of the kinematic sequence, including pelvis turn, chest turn, lead upper arm speed, and shaft angular speed. These are all angular velocities, and we pick the max max velocity of each of those segments. Um, and show you a tile for each of them. And then of course, uh, linear speed, we include the club head speed now. Um, all the way at the bottom right corner, you'll see the club head speed max uh, showing 119 for Max Homa's driver. Um, couple other things, and I'll show you where, where you can find them. If you go to your numbers tiles, um, you'll see these lists. I'll go come back to this later, but to find the linear speed, tap on the linear speed tab here, and you'll see the hand speed tracker and then indicators, you'll see the hand speed max and the club at speed max. And then if you go to kinematic sequence, you'll see the max speeds of the um, angular velocity of the, the pelvis, chest, arm, and shaft. Um, and then you'll see these numbers called core gain factor, shoulder gain factor, wrist gain factor. I'm not going to talk about them too much because I think Phil and Ryan are going to cover that. Um, but really cool stuff here for um, teaching speed or true speed training. So excited for you guys to dig in further. Time, um, you'll see, you may have missed this one. Uh, we added backswing time, downswing time, and uh, milliseconds to impact from which the hand speed maxes out, so 50 milliseconds until impact from where Max Homa's hand speed maxes out. Um, so that's a cool little piece of information to, again, do speed training and you know release timing, that kind of stuff. Um, and then one more thing I'll share is if you go to any of these tiles now, you'll see uh, the numbers divided into a set of trackers and a set of indicators. And I know Phil will talk about this more, but um, trackers are uh, what we've been showing. So pelvis turn, you see a different number for every single part of the swing, every single frame of the swing. Um, so one tracker has many, many, many different values in it. Indicators are one value per swing. So pelvis turn at the top is an indicator. So 45 degrees, that's, that doesn't change as you move the swing, that's just one number for the swing. Um, and the, the reason why this is, uh, this is a neat tool for coaching and training is you now can do, choose the one number you're interested in checking. So let's say I just wanna work on my turn at the top and um, I, I don't want to have to track uh, the tracker and, you know, go to the top of the swing and all this stuff, just choose pelvis turn at top and chest turn at top. And every swing I analyze, I'll just see those numbers. Same thing with lift. Um, I personally like to check um, pelvis lift into impact. What this number is, it calculates the difference between uh, where your pelvis lift is at, at its lowest point in the downswing, so like where it drops into its lowest position in the downswing, and the pelvis lift value at impact position. So however somebody jumps up between the that squat and kind of impact position, it calculates that for you. So it could almost be a proxy for vertical force uh, measurement. Um, so if you're looking to, like, if you see somebody who's just kind of sliding around in the, in the downswing and they're not really, you know, using, using their legs to jump up, uh, with their driver, let's say you want to look at this number, if it's pretty flat, um, versus, you know, Rory, who's got four and a half inches of lift between the lowest position and impact, you, you know, that's something that they can optimize. Um, so 
that's a cool little indicator that you can use um, to shortcut your process a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop here and turn things over to Phil and Ryan, but for more tips and tricks, um, please sign up for the bootcamp. Um, all right, so the floor is yours, Phil, Ryan, take it away. Thanks, Jihei. So we'll do the typical format. Um, I'll start with some theory, um, talk about what like Jihei said, nerding out a little bit. And then uh, Ryan will take it over and show how it's practically applied. So let me go in now and uh, share my screen. First, I'll, yeah, let's go share screen. Screen three. And then I'll start the slideshow. All right, are we good? Does that show up the way it's supposed to? All right. So we're going to talk about the kinematic sequence. And I'm really excited about uh, having this now because it's kind of my bag, uh, my jam, as they would say. I We developed this way back in 2004 when I was working with AMM and TPI at the time. And it's caught on a lot over the last uh, oh, 20 years. My goodness. Um, it's even used in baseball and other sports now as well. So very happy that we've got it in uh, sports box finally. Um, and so I'll start out with just a, a little bit of background, and then I'll dig into the numbers that we actually can provide um, in Sportsbox. So just going way, way, way back um, to 1968, uh, two gentlemen called Cochrane and Stobbs from England or the UK, they wrote a book called Search for the Perfect Swing. And this was the first hint that there was a kinematic sequence in golf. They kind of came up with this little model, looks a little weird, but it's basically three discs, each one getting smaller as it sits on top of the, the previous one, and each one joined by a spring. And each one can spin around the center uh, post. And the question they asked, in what order should the springs be released to impart the greatest possible rotation speed to the topmost cylinder? And you'll see in a minute why it relates to, to golf if you haven't already figured it out. Um, but the answer they came up with is that they should operate in sequence from the bottom upwards with each successive spring releasing when the most energy of the previous spring has been imparted to the system. And so you can see that that would happen sequentially. And that was kind of like the foundation of the kinematic sequence and it developed further and further until we actually uh, wrote algorithms to represent it with the AMM system way back in the early 2000s. So let's look at another analogy to kind of understand why the kinematic sequence is important and, and how it relates to the body. Um, I call this one the rocket ship analogy. And as you probably know, rocket ships go up in multiple stages. And the, the first stage is the most powerful stage with the most fuel and it carries the whole rocket off the launch pad into the few first few miles up into uh, space. And then when it runs out of fuel, um, it drops away. And the rest of the rocket ship, stage two and stage three, are now much lighter because they've dropped away the previous section and they're going much, much faster. So the second stage then takes it from there and it propels the rest of the rocket ship uh, up into space. And finally, when it's done its job, it uh, is run out of fuel and it drops away too. And now the third and final stage is accelerating very, very rapidly uh, to escape velocity of what, 17,500 miles per hour. And it finally gets out into orbit. And the reason that that's similar to golf is that we have a kinematic sequence in the golf swing and we have the lower body which is kind of uh, analogous to the rocket ship because it carries everything above it. And then we have the pelvis and then we have the chest and the, the arms and the club. So we kind of have four stages, if you like, or four sections. And each one of those section turns in sequence in the downswing. So if you look at this graph here, and by the way, this is a graph from Sportsbox. We don't expose them yet, but we probably will do in the future. 
we pull our variables and our, our values or uh, indicators from these graphs, but it's instructive to look at what's going on here. So this gray area is the downswing. The bottom axis, the x-axis is the time throughout the entire swing. So you got backswing, downswing, and follow through. And on the vertical axis, you've got rotational speed or angular speed or turning speed. There's a lot of different names for it, but it's how fast you're turning in degrees per second. So if we look at the beginning of the downswing here at, uh, at the top, we see that each one of these accelerates one by one. And again, kind of analogous to the rocket ship, the pelvis accelerates first, but then kind of decelerates after it's passed its energy to the next segment, which is the chest. It accelerates, passes energy to the arm, and then it accelerates and passes energy to the shaft. Interesting thing, though, is they don't continue to accelerate. They actually decelerate um, after they've reached their peak uh, of acceleration. And that's because the upper segment is really trying to power off from the lower segment. And so when the chest tries to turn fast, it turns upon the pelvis and it actually pulls on the pelvis in the opposite direction and makes it slow down. So this is a natural sequence of human motion in many, many different sports. So it's in baseball, it's in tennis, any throwing, kicking uh, type sports, this rotational kinematic sequence can be seen. Um, and it's, it's really um, beautiful, I think, that the human body moves like this in such an efficient manner. Of course, when you're a pro, if you were to look at a novice one, it would not be so pretty as this one. And um, we may look at that later, probably not in this uh, segment today, but in the future, we're going to be doing more kinematic sequence um, presentations as we go. So that's, uh, and the interesting thing is you can see where the body is here in each of these four positions or four peak speeds. So surprisingly, to me at least it was, is the peak speed of where the pelvis reaches its maximum and then starts to decelerate is at about arm parallel and about pelvis square to the, uh, to the target line. Um, so that's kind of early in the swing and it is. After that, it decelerates, passes energy up to the chest and then the chest reaches its maximum speed around about, oh, I'd say arm at about 45 degrees. Um, and then just a little bit later, um, just a fraction later, the arm reaches its maximum speed. And finally at impact, uh, the shaft reaches its maximum speed. So notice every one of the body segments other than the shaft peak out before impact. And that's important to remember. And we'll see that more and more and more with all kinds of speeds, even the linear speeds, like your lead hand speed, it peaks out before impact too. And the timing is really important. Um, we're not gonna get deeply into the timing today, but we will definitely look at that in the future. So there is a lot of uh, invaluable data in the kinematic sequence, not just the sequencing. And by the way, we expect to see this sequencing um, one, two, three, four, in other words, pelvis, chest, arm, club. And if that is out of sequence, then you lose your efficiency and you're not going to transfer speed as well. But there's a lot of other important things, and that's where we've got our indicators, so to speak. We've pulled off numbers from these curves, and we can get the peak speeds of the body segments. We can get this peak gains, how much each one is gaining. We can get a gain factor, which I'll talk about, and we can get a percent contribution by each body segment and at each joint. So let's look at these. So firstly, let's look at the max rotational speeds. And this data is coming from the AMM database, but we're building our databases at Sportsbox very rapidly. And so we'll have more data, not just for men, dry, um, uh, tall pros, but also for um, women, tall pros and novices and different strata, different sections of, um, Handicap, so you can kind of compare yourself to other people in your area. Um, so let's see. The chest turns faster than the pelvis, and you can see that it maxes out about 480 degrees per second. By the way, these are in degrees per second. And if you remember, there's 360 degrees in one circle or in one rotation. So 480 degrees 
is about what, maybe one and a half, one and a quarter rotations. And this is per second. So if you turn that, you turn more than one rotation per second. And then we look at how fast the chest is turning, 730 degrees per second. So uh, that's a bit more than two rotations per second. And so you see the speed has increased. And then finally, the arm at 1,000 degrees per second and the club uh, shaft. Now, this is interesting because the 2,280 degrees per second is the actual swinging speed of the shaft, in like I said, in degrees per second. So what we do to measure that is we take the shaft position in one frame of the video, and then it'll swing down a little bit further in the next frame. And we simply measure the angle between the two shafts, one frame to the next frame, and we divide it by the time. And that tells us how many degrees per second your shaft is moved. So the, the larger that angle, the faster your shaft is moving. Um, I think I noticed a little typo here. I forgot to put the two in there. Apologies on that. I'll fix it for next time. But it's 2,280 for the Tor Pro. And so there's a very important speed increase from each body segment to the next across each joint. Um, so let's look at what we can do with that. Well, now we can get speed gains. We can get how much did your muscles uh, increase your rotational speed from your pelvis to your chest. So how much did your core muscles, your abs, how much did they increase your speed in your swing? Then from the chest to the arms, how much did your shoulders increase the speed? And then finally, in your wrist release from your arm to the shaft, how much extra speed did that wrist release impart to the shaft itself? So you can see you get a good gain from the core and the shoulders, but you get a massive gain from the wrists. And that makes sense if you think about it, because the arms in the club are definitely much, much lighter than the pelvis and the chest. And so they can move much rapidly, much more rapidly. Plus, they've had the benefit of gaining the extra speed from the pelvis and the chest. And we'll show again how this all can be used. And Ryan will show you how he actually diagnoses the swing and where the weak links are. Obviously, if we've got some ranges that you can uh, gauge by, if some are high and some are low, then you can figure out, oh, OK, that's the weak link and we need to do work on that. So what did we do next? We actually said, well, we can use these gains in speed from one segment to the next, and we can come up with speed gain factors, kind of much like you use uh, the smash factor uh, between the club head and the ball. So this is kind of the body, uh, the body's equivalent to the smash factor, but at each joint. And bigger is not necessarily better. It's more important to have a balance. Um, in fact, if one is too big, it may uh, leave you for a potential for injury. So they're really, really good indicators of performance, uh, injury prevention, and the balance of the swing. So as I said, if you look at the smash factor, just to remind you, um, the smash factor is the ball speed divided by the club speed. And a 1.45 is an excellent smash factor. For example, if your club, uh, your ball speed was 145, your club head speed was 100, that'd be 145 over 100, and that would be a 1.45 smash factor. And that's what we do with the body. And it's a whole new area of, uh, of powerful metrics that we can use uh, to analyze your swing. So let's look at it. So here's the gain factors at each joint, at the core between your chest and your, sorry, your pelvis and your chest, and at your shoulder between your chest and your arm, and at the wrist between your arm and the shaft of the club. So you can see that each gain factor is the previous segment divided by the next segment. And that gives us a factor. And it turns out that for our tour database, we found that 1.5 is a typical, at least for the males, the women are a little bit different. And I'll show some of those uh, a bit later on in, in a table that I've got on the women and the men. So 1.5 and 1.4, I told you they're kind of very similar, but you get a 2.3 gain across the wrist. So that's huge. Um, and we'll look at some numbers uh, in some examples later on. Um, again, if these are out of whack, 
it's really easy to see where the error is coming from. Now, one other uh, mathematical uh, trick that we played is looking at the percent contribution from each of the core muscles, like going from the legs to the pelvis, from the abs to the chest, from the shoulder muscles to the arm, and from the wrist and forearm muscles to the shaft. And we can see that there's like 20% of your speed is typically partitioned or developed by your legs, 12% by your core muscles, 10% by your shoulder, and 55% by your wrists. And again, if we look at any of these and say, for example, you had 60% at the wrist and 7% at the shoulders, then we would know, hey, that guy's really good at generating speed from his wrists or her wrists, um, but that's kind of a little bit unbalanced. And and maybe he's up for potential some wrist injuries or some wrist repetitive strain injuries. Um, I like quite often have seen um, elderly golf instructors typically have a very, very high number here from 57 to 60, meaning that they're really good at using their wrist release to gain speed, uh, but they've got a little bit older and so their body doesn't generate quite as much speed anymore. So it's really telling and it tells a story on where the speeds are coming from and how well they're balanced. So why is that important though? Well, it turns out that your turning speeds of your body and your arms contribute directly to your club head speed. And there's statistical correlations that say the higher pelvis speed, the higher chest speed, the higher lead arm and shaft speed will all relate to a higher club head speed, provided they are transferred and transmitted all the way through to the club. Um, I won't read all the statistics, but basically, yes, there is a high statistical correlation. Okay, just a couple of little examples, and then I'll pass it on to uh, Ryan. Um, so what can you do with this? Well, we analyzed a Tor Pro uh, who was having um, low club head speed, wasn't happy with his distance, and wanted to know why. So we got the kinematic sequence from his swing. And this is the actual graph showing us uh, what the peak speeds are and what the gain factors are, and even what there's a uh, percentage contributed by joint. So we found out that compared to our tour ranges, he was very low on his pelvis turn speed. And that kind of, he gained a little bit more on the chest and the upper arm, but again, it was a little bit low in the shaft speed. And so because he was low in his pelvis speed, he had to work harder to gain it from the pelvis to the chest. And so try and pick it back up again. Unfortunately, it didn't flow all the way through. And so what we recommended was that he needs to get that speed up. Now, this is a diagnostic tool. And obviously the next step is, well, hey, what do I do with it? But at least now you know where to uh, work and what to focus on in order to increase your speed. Um, so it's very telling, very telling and very powerful and can help avoid injury and can help you pinpoint where you need to work on it. And, and Ryan's got some perfect examples that he's gonna talk about in just a minute. But here is uh, something that I found very interesting when we compared men and women, this is a different database. So the numbers might be slightly different, but this is comparing men and women tour players. Um, for max rotational speed, speed gain across joints, and percent contribution. If we start out here, we see that men and women, very similar. In fact, the women have pelvis turning speed max is a little higher than the men. Chest turning speed max, about the same as the men. Um, but this is where it starts to differ. The men's arm speed is higher and the men's club speed is higher. So the women uh, lose it in the arms, and that could be a most likely a strength issue. I have another presentation where we look at the, the differences in the muscles and the differences in the flexibility between men and women. And that's kind of where it shows up in, in the arms. Um, and so let's look at the speed gain. Again, the similar story to what we just saw in the maximum speeds, the women from the legs are faster than the men, uh, but then it starts to decrease as we go down the chain. Um, and again, this tells a, a, an interesting story 
uh, as to how the women and the men can gain speed. So let's look at the percent. Where do the women gain their speed or uh, how do they petition their speed? The women gain more speed from their legs than the men do. They gain the same amount in percentage wise from the core and from the shoulder, but the men gain 56% uh, from the wrist release and the women only gain 50% from the wrist release. So, you know, if the men were going to gain some more speed, they could get it from the lower body. If the women were going to gain some more speed, they could look at it from the wrist release. So again, differences between men and women. You can also do the differences between novices and pros and find out where your golfer is has the energy leak or has the speed leak and focus on that. Now, slightly off topic, but I'm going to throw this in because we're very proud of it. Um, we're doing club head speed trackers, and we'll have another seminar on that for sure in the near future. Um, but we did a recent uh, comparison between TrackMan, AMM club head speed, and Sportsbox club head speed. And we saw that they were very, very similar. This was 34 different swings in the range of 97 to 122 miles per hour. And the club head speed is measured just before impact. So we found that there was uh, between Sportsbox and TrackMan, 3.1 miles an hour difference between Sportsbox and AMM. So they weren't the same either. They were slightly different, 3.5 miles per hour. And then TrackMan to AMM, 3.2 miles per hour. So these are all in the vicinity of about 3% difference. So what that tells you in a nutshell is that now you can measure club head speed with Sportsbox directly from your phone. You don't need a $25,000 uh, or whatever track man just to measure speed. And you can do it with the Sportsbox app. So I think that's pretty exciting news and we're proud of that. And we're gonna be talking more about club head speed and excuse me, hand speed as we go in the next seminars. But now I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan Crawley, one of the best young teachers in the United States. And he's going to give us uh, um, his ideas on practical ac applications of the kinematic sequence. So with that, I will stop sharing and I'll hand it over to Ryan. Thanks, Will. Appreciate that. All right, let me just get my screen pulled up. Uh, I'm really excited to kind of present on this and, and give some insight here. Uh, this is something that's been pretty cool for me as an instructor. So I'm just going to go through uh, two different examples. One of them just strictly kind of looking at it from a, a diagnostic standpoint, um, and then actually like an actual lesson that I did this with. So I really enjoy being able to look at obviously the kinematic sequence and, and being able to look at a graph is obviously really important. But I always felt as an instructor, when I look at a graph, I can't get nearly as much information as, you know, Dr. Phil Cheatham can. And I always felt like I got to lean on Phil to be able to pull a lot of that great information out of a graph. And with these gain factors and these contribution percents, I basically feel like I got Phil with me at all times, just being able to, um, you know, have this information that's really easy for a coach that has no idea how to look at a graph to be able to get this insight from it. So the first example that I want to go into is one of my players that plays on the Canadian tour. Um, we've noticed that he's been starting to hit the ball a little bit farther. So he's been doing a few different things. And I was just curious, like, well, what is actually allowing him to hit the ball farther now? And moving forward, where can we keep getting a little bit more speed from? So last year in the fall, uh, we were looking at his seven iron club head speed. It was 84 miles an hour. And in March of this year, we saw that his club head speed is essentially 89 miles an hour with his seven iron. So, you know, he's not as fast as, you know, the tour average, but he's definitely getting there uh, when we look at this. He was doing a few different things. So he's been working out actually consistently. So that's going to help. He's been doing a lot of speed training, which is going to help. And I was just curious, you know, how does that actually relate to his golf swing in the actual degrees per second with those max turn speeds? So I just took both the swings and just put it into a little uh, diagram here. 
And you can kind of see the differences between, you know, his two swings and then also that PGA Tour average for a mid iron here. So when I look at this, you know, pelvis turn speed, chest turn speed, lead upper arm, and the shaft swing speed across the board, he's going to be low. You know, he's not going to be at that PGA Tour uh, average, which makes sense because he doesn't hit it as far as your average PGA Tour pro. Now, this is still really good information for us to be able to see, you know, where is it that he is lacking some of that speed? What is causing him um, to miss out on a few more yards here? When we look at the difference from 2022 and then, you know, in March of 23, his pelvis and chest turn speed essentially stayed the same. Uh, there really wasn't a difference there. Uh, and you can see that between those two numbers. When you look at his lead upper arm, we did see a slight increase, which makes sense because he has been doing a lot of speed training. And then we also noticed that the shaft swing speed picked up a little bit. So instead of being, you know, 1853, he's now at 1940. So almost a hundred mile, a hundred degrees per second there uh, increase. And that's what was allowing him to really be able to pick up that five miles an hour that we saw in his swing. Now the gain factors I absolutely love because, you know, when you look at the, the max turn speeds degree per second, obviously the higher the degrees per second, the further the person's going to hit the golf ball. The great part about these gain factors is your average player, when you look at them, of course, they're not going to be moving as fast as a tour player, but they can still have the efficiency of a tour player gain factor. So I find this information really practical when I'm working on my players. And I'll show you that inside the app with the lesson that I had over this past weekend. Now, when we look at Nick, for his gain factors, we're going to see, you know, core gain factor 1.46. So a little bit less than the PGA tour mid iron of 1.5. We're going to see his shoulder gain factor. There was definitely a jump there. So he went from 1.39 to 1.45 where the PGA tour is 1.4. And then you're going to see for the wrist gain, there's a slight increase. So from 2.28 to 2.3, um, where he's slightly underneath that average for the PGA tour. So what can we do with this information as we're kind of looking at it? So we can see for Nick where he was able to increase his speed was obviously through that lead upper arm, through the shaft swing, uh, shaft swing speed here. Um, that's where he was able to, you know, really pick up that five miles an hour. Now, when we look at his numbers, you know, degrees per second, and we try to plan out the future here, and, and where can we get him to actually pick up a little speed? That's where the contribution percent is really helpful and being able to look and identify, okay, where can I get him to get a little bit more speed and where can we not? So looking at Nick here, you can see the contribution percent from obviously the fall and then of uh, March this year. And then you can see for the PGA Tour. So one thing that's going to be standing out here is for Nick, his core contribution is going to be a little bit low. It's at 9.3, where the PGA Tour is going to be at 11%. If we look, we can see that his shoulder contribution is a little bit higher. We can see that his wrist contribution is at 57. Um, so he's right on par for the PGA Tour. So this information is great because it just shows us that, you know, most likely with speed training, Nick's probably not going to gain nearly as much speed off of his, you know, lead upper arm and shaft swing speed, you know, just focusing on that, trying to increase it where the low hanging fruit is for Nick moving forward is through that core contribution is getting it so that his pelvis and chest turn speeds actually increase. So now moving forward, it, it comes to the actual, you know, how do we do that? Um, and that can be done in a few different ways. So obviously you have to look at it from a player standpoint of, you know, technique wise, is there anything that's going to cause that player to have their pelvis and chest turn speed be a little bit slower, uh, from a technique standpoint, is it something more physical, you know, for Nick, I believe it's more physically, he's not the biggest guy, he's five foot seven, you know, getting in the gym. So he's getting a little bit, you know, bigger in terms of muscle mass. So for me, it was a really good way to communicate with his fitness professional and let him know, hey, 
you know, I really want to focus on getting his pelvis and chest turn speeds to be a little bit faster. They can tailor a whole gym uh, plan all around that. And that's where hopefully over the next year, we start to see him pick up a little bit more speed is through that pelvis and, and chest turn speed. So that's one way that we can obviously, you know, use these numbers. Like Phil said, it's a diagnostic tool, just trying to see, okay, where is the leak in power? It's also nice to be able to see, okay, why is my player being able to hit the ball farther if they are picking up speed or why are they not hitting the ball further? And that was the case for this weekend. So I'm going to actually pull up the app and we'll dive into one of my players here. So this is going to be Declan. Declan I've worked with for quite a while. He plays college golf and he just messaged me, letting me know, like I'm hitting everything 10, 15 yards short. And I don't understand why. So came in for a lesson. We're watching him hit shots. And the first thing I wanted to do was just take a look at these um, gain factors and, and then look at that club head speed, kind of see where he's at. So looking at the gain factors here, we're going to see his core gain factor is 1.49, shoulder gain factor is 1.26, and then wrist gain factor is 2.09. What I think is really cool about these gain factors is just like all of us coaches know that 1.5 is a great smash factor. These gain factors are going to have that value as well. And it's going to take a little bit of time for us to memorize that. It doesn't really take long. Uh, but for Declan here, when I look at this information, core gain factor is pretty good. 1.49, we're looking at 1.5 for the tour there. When we look at shoulder gain factor, we're going to see that he's definitely underneath the PGA Tour average is at 1.26. PGA Tour is going to be at 1.4. And then risk gain factor, we're definitely going to see a bigger drop there too, where he's at 2.09 and his risk gain factor should be, or where you want the PGA Tour level would be 2.4. And he's swinging it at 79 miles an hour here. And that's with a seven iron that we're looking at. So definitely a little bit slower from where he typically is uh, swinging from. When we look at the actual, you know, degrees per second and take a look at those. We're going to see kind of across the board once again, like he's going to be a little bit lower than the PGA tour. Um, his pelvis turn speeds pretty solid. It's 420 the PGA tour. You're looking for 451. You're going to see chest turn speed. He's at 624. So he's a little slow. He's going to be at 693, not too far off. And then really where we're seeing the drop is going to be with that lead upper arm and then the shaft speed max. So we can see he's at 788, where you want to be at 945. And then you're going to see for shaft speed, he's at 1646, where you want to be at like 228, 2228. So obviously with the lesson, I'm giving you guys a lot more information and kind of backstory. For me, when I'm looking at this information, it's pretty quick for me to identify, okay, Lead upper arm, shaft speed, definitely going to be a little bit slow. Now, what's causing that? And so we look at his golf swing. And as we're watching his golf swing, from a just a 2D perspective, one thing that really stood out to me was just his release. You can see that he's actually unhinging that club a little early. Now, the great part about that is, is now I can actually go and verify. I can pull that up. And so I'm watching him. And I see right away that, you know, hey, that looks a little odd. Maybe that's what's causing this leak in speed. And so we can go and just pull up, you know, lead wrist angle here. And then the other one that I pulled up just to kind of talk him through was uh, mid-hand sway. So when we're looking at this lead wrist angle, we can see at the top of his swing, he has 98 uh, degrees. And then on the way down, he's going to be lose it. <clears throat> losing some of that flex. So he's now at 102. And what's happening is he's releasing that club a little early. And that's actually getting his arms to kind of get stuck behind him a little bit. And we see that with that mid hand sway number being negative 12 inches. So obviously, if we get him to add a little bit of downswing loading, or feel like he's adding some flex on the way down, we should see an improvement in that lead upper arm and that shaft speed max that he was uh, lacking there. And so that's what we worked on. Um, what I did with him 
basically just had them take the club up to the top. I took a little golf club, kind of put it on the uh, top of the shaft there. And I just wanted him to feel like he couldn't push it just to get him to feel like he was actually adding a little bit of that downswing loading. He's an athletic player. He's a good player. So it really wasn't too hard of a change for him, but we can see the difference in his golf swing through all these numbers now too. So this was three swings in. So he takes it up to the top. He added a little bit more of a wrist angle. Now he's at 89. And you're going to see here in transition how he's actually adding some of that downswing loading. So he's going to add some flex there on the way down. And just look at the difference there at lead arm parallel and where the shaft is much, much better. And a cool way to kind of show that too, by the way, um, is the shaft angle face on. It's a really good measurement to kind of show where that shaft is. I think that's one that gets missed at times. So we can see the improvement there. If we look at Declan here at lead arm or at shaft parallel, you can see now that the mid hand sway is improved, lead wrist angles improved. And when we go and look at the actual, you know, linear speed, go look at club head speed, he's going to be at 90 miles an hour. So he picked up 10 miles an hour from this adjustment that we made. And the great part is, is we can obviously verify all that. We could see it in the golf ball, of course, but it was really good for him to be able to see right away. Okay. When I feel like I'm adding some of that flex on the way down, we're seeing that club head speed jump. And when you look at it from the kinematic sequence standpoint, you're going to be able to see here from those gain factors where he was able to increase that speed. So we're going to notice his core gain factor went a little bit less. He was at 1.49 before. Now he's at 1.44, so a little lower than before. You're going to see that his shoulder gain factor, you know, a little bit more. And then really the big jump here was with that wrist gain factor. So now he's at 2.5, where before he was at 2.09. So this is a really good way to be able to obviously use this on a day-to-day -day lesson. I think that these gain factors is a really, really good information because it applies to everyone. Um, obviously, when you're looking at the max speeds, that's great for really good players. Players that hit the golf ball far, you're just going to see that their max speed is going to be higher. But for our average Joes, this core gain factor, the shoulder gain factor, wrist gain factor is really, really great information. And when we come out with the contribution percent in the app, everybody's going to love that too. So. Like I said, it was a really perfect lesson, honestly, for me to have right before this, you know, him showing up, just taking a look at his swing, looking at these gain factors, seeing, all right, shoulder gain factor, wrist gain factor look pretty low. What could be causing that in the swing? You know, being able to identify what the issue was, which was obviously not adding any of that downswing loading, wasn't adding any flex. And, uh, you know, a few swings later, just gave him the right feel. And right away, you could see how he picked up 10 miles an hour uh, from where he was before. Awesome. Let's open up to questions. Feel free. You can put it right in the chat of that Q&A if you have any. I think you can answer live, Ryan, if you. Oh, perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. so for the colors changing, that's on iPad, that's on iPhone, that's on Android. So it, it's not only limited to iPad. Once you're at key positions, it'll color code and tell you where they're in or out of range relative to the PGA or LPGA tour. Uh, the colors are based on driver data currently, but I know Phil and his team are working on the mid iron data. Yeah, and that will automatically switch depending on what club you choose. Uh, John, 
That is correct. Uh, club head speed can only be measured when you record inside the app. If you're importing a video, you will not see that club head speed. Janine, any drills for someone who loses speed from torso to lead arm? I see many ladies drop speed here. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different drills that you could kind of look at there. You know, for me, I would be trying to look at, um, you know, why, why are they seeing that drop? And then based on that, being able to choose kind of the right drill. Janine, if you have any like really good examples, we can always jump on a call and, and dive into that too. So Brian asked, how do you like to increase players wrist angle without adding list, uh, lead wrist extension? You know, obviously you see players that go towards flexion, lose angle and players towards extension increase. It's a really good question. I think it kind of depends on the, each of the players, um, you know, for Declan, him adding some of that definitely did add a little bit of lead wrist extension. Now for him, the club face was very square still. So it really didn't matter to me that he was adding a little bit of, of that um, because he was able to still, you know, maintain that face. And uh, obviously you saw the distance increase from that. So, um, you know, that's just kind of the nature of the beast when you are you adding a lot of, you know, typically adding a lot of that downswing angle, um, you know, a lot of times that lead wrist does want to get extended just so that they get more angle. I think if you're looking at how much the wrist is, you know, adding, that also plays a role. So there is, a, you know, obviously the more that they add, a lot of times you're going to see that angle be, uh, that extension be a little bit more than flexion. Yeah, and it can come from radial deviation as well. There's mm -hmm. three degrees of freedom in the wrist and forearm. And so each one of those, depending in what portion of the swing you're in, can add to uh, more wrist set or more wrist release. Let's see. So drills to increase hip speed, focus on core or ground force. Um, yeah, obviously, it, once again, kind of what I would say to like what I said to Janine, um, I would be looking to try to see why is it going to be a little bit slow? Is there something technically happening that could be causing it? Is it something that's physically causing that? Um, obviously, increasing ground force could be one way to be able to increase that speed. Um, it, it just kind of depends on the person that's in front of you, I would say. Phil, do you have any good uh, ideas on that? Well, not specifically. I think I agree with you. I mean, are they going to go into the gym to increase lower body power? Uh, maybe, or is it a is it a technique thing? Or are they not? Do they not know how to apply torque? As you said, the ground force torque at the lead and trail foot, and the shear forces between the feet. Um, there's some little exercises you can do for that. So it really depends, like you said, um, on what the issue is. Bill, I'm going to let you answer this one. Would pressure slash kinetic sequence slash ground force influence the golfer's ability to increase lead wrist angle in early downswing? By increased lead wrist angle, I guess we we're talking about increasing the downswing loading, increasing the set. Well, yeah, I mean, this it, it's kind of interesting to me. It's like a chicken and the egg. Um, are you casting the club because you're casting the club or are you casting the club because your lower body motion is incorrect? So again, it, you have to come back and you have to diagnose what's going on. Um, and so pressure in the ground transmits back up to the body. And so if you've got more rotational uh, torque produced at the force uh, in the ground, at the ground reaction forces, then yeah, you may be able to allow the lead arm and the shaft to lag a little bit more 
and increase the set angle that way. Um, in Ryan's case, he just literally increased the lead set angle. So a couple of ways. And again, it depends on what the golfer's doing. But yeah, looking at the forces and, and the torques in the ground are important, but not every one of us has dual force plates to, to do that with. Awesome. If you get negative mid-hand sway in the downswing, does that mean there is little width in the swing? Uh, you know, when we're looking at mid-hand sway, and I can just pull that up. So when you look at mid-hand sway, that's just going to be telling us, you know, how much the hands relative to where we set up at is moving away or towards the target. So depending where they are is going to determine, you know, width. If you're looking at it that way, um, obviously ranges are going to be ranges. They're going to be pretty, you know, I would say big at times when we're looking at, you know, PGA and LPGA tour. And for anybody that doesn't know, if you tap on these tiles, you'll be able to see what that range is. So when we look at mid-hand sway here for downswing club horizontal, we can see the range is anywhere from 10.9 to 6.3 inches uh, away from where we were originally set up at. So in Declan's case, when he started, he was at negative 12. So he was getting his arms a little bit too far behind him. And that was because he was obviously releasing that club a little too early. That got his club path a little bit too far inside. And, you know, he was just hitting bigger blocks and hooks um, because of that there. So um, when you're looking at mid-hand sway, um, it, it can kind of indicate width, I would say. Uh, it's not the perfect measurement there. We would actually probably want to create one for that um, because there's some way if you look at width that you could technically um, kind of manipulate that, I would say. If you have somebody that is swaying off the golf ball with their chest and their pelvis excessively, naturally their mid-hand sway is going to be larger or somebody where their um, you know, pelvis and chest move towards the target a lot. Uh, as they go up to the top, their mid-hand sway is going to be less. So it's not the perfect way to look at with. Um, we would probably want to create a measurement for that in the future. And then Stanley asks, any plans to add simple sequence like one, two, three, four, hip, chest, arm, club? Yeah, I'll answer that one. Um... There are two specific sequences in the rotational kinematic sequence. And the first one is the transition sequence, how you start the downswing. And uh, that would be, you know, do you start with the pelvis, then the chest, then the arm, then the club? And yeah, we are going to be adding that. We're working on that. And we're also looking at the uh, acceleration, deceleration sequence or the peaking order, which is in the downswing. So those two sequences are being worked on and uh, stay tuned. Um, they'll be there in the future. Bill, I have a question. What if, if how do you look at the transition sequence versus the peaking order sequence? Uh, what's important for what information? Yeah, the transition sequence is, is good for setting up power in the downswing um, because, and we have a whole presentation on that and it's looking at Things like the X factor stretch, um, the lead shoulder extra stretch, the downswing loading of the club. Those are all transition sequence power generators, if you like. And uh, you want that to go one, two, three, four, so that you want to get a stretch at the core, you want to get a stretch at the shoulder, and you want to get an extra stretch at the wrist. The um, downswing peaking order is more like an efficiency type measurement telling us when we're decelerating and when we're trans, uh, transferring energy to the next body segment. And so that's more of, is your swing efficient and are you transferring energy uh, in a nice orderly manner? And where are the leaknesses, uh, the leaknesses, the leakages in the um, acceleration, deceleration kinematic sequence? So they're two different ones. One kind of sets up your downswing and one tells you how efficient you are in your downswing. Very cool. Well, we're right 
at time. Should we do one more one more question and then wrap? Yeah, we can do that. Let's see what we got here. And we got two more questions. Let's get those out of the way and, and, and let's get those answered and then we'll wrap after that. Cool. So Tim asks, is there a way to determine max hand speed in the downswing, in the backswing and downswing separately without scrolling through the swing? So currently in the app, the max hand speed uh, indicator, which is um, a way for you to check the max speed in the downswing without scrolling through, it is for the downswing. There is no way to check the max hand speed in the backswing yet without just scrolling through. But if this is a important metric, we will take that into consideration. Then what if the player has a wrong transition sequence but the right peaking sequence? Interesting. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that, but obviously that could easily happen. It just means they're setting themselves up if they if they've got an incorrect transition sequence they're not setting themselves up for the most optimal in power, but they may be transferring what energy they generated. They may be transferring it well. So they are two different ways of thinking about how you get the most club head speed at impact. Is your swing efficient? Is your transition powerful? So two different things. Cool. Well, then last one. Coil, uh, I can answer that one as well. Yeah, that's a measurement um, that I think Rob Neal does with his particular system. Um, it's the basically the um, X factor closing speed, if you like. Um, yeah, that's something we can uh, look at and we'll put it under advisement. Um, it's, it's not a very difficult calculation. Um, so we'll check it out. Perfect. Well, that was really, really interesting and helpful information. I hope that was uh, helpful for everybody on the call. Um, again, we appreciate you joining the call and, and uh, taking time to learn. Um, we'll you know, be announcing the next webinar soon. Um, if you guys have any thoughts or feedback on what other information we can cover in our future webinars or any speakers you'd like to see, please, um, send us that feedback via email or DM or text us. Um, we'd love to hear from you. But um, and thank you, Phil and Ryan, um, for for all the great knowledge sharing you did today. Um, and uh, we'll see everybody again soon.